Hear the holy roar of God resound. Hear the holy roar of God resound. And watch the waters part before us now. Watch the waters part before us now. Come and see what He has done for us. Tell the world of His great love. Our God is a God who saves. Our God is a God who saves. Let God arise. Let God arise. Our God reigns now and forever. He reigns now and forever. Arise. Let God arise. Our God reigns now and forever. He reigns now and forever. His enemies will run for sure. His enemies will run for sure. And the church will stand, she will endure. And the church will stand, she will endure. He holds the keys of life, our Lord. Death has no sting, no final word. Our God is a God who saves. Our God is a God who saves. Let God arise, let God arise. Our God reigns now and forever. God who saves. Our God is a God who saves. Our God is a God who saves. Our God is a God who saves. Let God arise. Let God arise. Our God reigns now and forever. He reigns now and forever. give you all some words of encouragement and maybe something to think about through this hard time right now and i'll be reading out of james chapter 1 starting in verse 2 consider it pure joy my brothers whenever you face trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete not lacking anything so obviously the big theme here perseverance you know just hanging there seeing things out and i'm not sure if you caught the first part in verse 2 when it says, consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. Um, obviously, that's something that's really hard to do whenever we're going through stuff. And it's something we don't do. And uh, especially now in this time, you can just feel like everything is just happening at once and everything is falling. You know, everything is just crumbling around you. I know I felt like that lately and that um, everything is just happening at once and you just can't but wonder why. Why does everything have to happen now? But... I think an important thing to keep in mind in that it says, um, you know, nothing can come bad out of the trials that we face. Nothing can come bad out of perseverance. And 
it's all a matter of perseverance honestly it's all a matter of us hanging in there and sticking this thing out and knowing that everything is going to be okay we're going to get through this and even in the very last part in verse 4 it says perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete not lacking anything uh, i think it's important that we all keep praying you know keep praying for each other praying for our world praying for our country praying for everyone you know and uh yeah I hope you all are staying safe. I hope you're all well, and I can't wait to see y'all. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Psalm 27, 4. I'm asking the Lord for only one thing. Here is what I want. I want to live in a house of the Lord all the days of my life, I want to look at the beauty of the Lord. I want to worship Him in His, te in his temple. Isaiah 40, 28 through 31. Do you not know, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the, cre the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary. In His understanding, no one can fit. And fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youth grows tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not be faint. Well, good evening, and thank you for joining us. If you have your Bibles, turn to 1 John chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 18. We're continuing our talk about light and dark images, and tonight I want to talk a, a lot about darkness. Uh, I think you'll hear maybe some foreboding, some uh, a bit scary images in this uh, passage in John, but uh, don't, don't be too concerned. It, it ends well. Verse 18, Dear children, this is the last hour. And as you've heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. I do not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie comes from the truth. Who is the liar? It's whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a person is the Antichrist, denying the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Father has no one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son also has the Father. As for you, see that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. If it does, you will also remain in the Son and in the Father. And this is what he promised us eternal life. I'm writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. As for you, the anointing you received from him remains in you, and you do not, do not need anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you, you teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it has taught you, remain in him. So tonight I want to start by talking about bugs. I hate bugs. And you can trace my hatred of bugs back to my childhood, specifically to the 1982 cinematic classic Star Trek The Wrath of Khan. And if you've seen the movie, well, if you haven't seen the movie, go ahead and pause and go watch it, and come back in two hours, and let's finish this lesson. In, in the, the story, and I'm going to uh, shrink this down, I'm going to shorten the story real quickly. Um, two of the, the, uh, the protagonists find themselves down on this planet, pl uh, planet and um, they're surrounded by the bad guys. And the bad guys take out these, what they call the SETI eels, and they take a, a little... Uh, a little baby eel, and they plant it in the ears of these guys, and it allows them to um, to uh, manipulate them, to mind control them. It's a terribly gross and disturbing scene. Uh, but by the way, spoiler alert: Chekhov uh, gets infected by one of the SETI eels, and then gets saved by Captain Kirk. Again, spoiler alert: and Captain Kirk delivers the great line, "I hate bugs." I'm the same way. And so tonight I want to talk about a different kind of bug, a bug of guilt and shame. Voices in your head that never stop reminding you 
of all the ways in which you've messed up, in which you've failed. Like those bugs, those eels that were implanted in the brains of those guys from the Star Trek, the Starship Enterprise, uh, they change how we view ourselves and what we know to be real. If you have those feelings of guilt, if you can, can kind of relate to what it's like to hear those voices. I said the other day that guilt and shame uh, comes to us in a voice that is our own. We hear that in our own voice, or it might be this way. The ink is our own, but the handwriting is Satan's. We're going to come back to that in just a minute. Martin Luther had a constant struggle with this. And so when he felt that, that, uh, that heaviness of shame and guilt, he would speak directly to it and he would quote Romans 8. John Bunyan, the author of Pilgrim's Progress, who was born in 1628, said that he would lay awake at night and he would hear his conscience telling him to, to, to get rid, to, uh, let's see, denounce Christ. And the way that he heard that was the, the phrase, sell him, sell him, sell him over again, just to sell out and, uh, and turn his back on Christianity. He wrote a little bit about that guilt and shame, and it's written in 17th century language, but, but I want you to hear it. I did ever so know what it was to be weary of my life and yet afraid to die. Oh, how gladly I would have been anybody but myself, anything but a man, and in any condition but my own. There was nothing that did cross my mind more frequently than it was impossible for me to be forgiven my transgression and be saved from the wrath to come. C.S. Lewis talked about his guilt, that those, those feelings, those, those voices of shame and guilt, of being like the low buzz of a radio, a background noise that just never went away, like a nagging injury that you can't quite rehabilitate from. It's just something that always stays with you, a, a, a piece of, of a splinter of, of wood that gets underneath your skin that you can't pull out. So many people in our culture, they desperately want to believe that it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere and that those beliefs don't hurt anyone. In other words, they don't believe that truth really matters. That's a dangerous lie because truth does matter. That's what John tells us, that anyone who denies who Jesus is, that person is an antichrist. That their paths, that path of... of uh, of, of falsity, uh, of false information actually leads us to destruction. John says it quite clearly this way, it matters how you walk. In fact, he uses that term over and over again in his letter, if we walk in the light as he is in the light. But if we're not walking in the light, then we're walking in the darkness, and the darkness is what? It obscures us from the true path. I remember a uh, a, a exercise we had to do in a counseling class that I took at ACU. And Dr. McElvain partnered us up, made us sit back to back to where we couldn't see one another. And we had to solve uh, how to get from, one, from point A to point B by using two different maps. Each of us had a map in front of us. And one was describing how to get to a certain place, and the other one was trying to orient themselves. But Dr. McElvain had played a terrible trick on us. He'd given us two different maps. What was true for one was false for the other. And we got increasingly agitated, angry at each other. We started sniping at each other. We thought the other one was an idiot. Both of us were right. And together, we were hopelessly lost and wrong. False information can even come from people around us, right? Even from good, quote-unquote, Christian people. It's Jesus who warned us in Matthew 7. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. In fact, they're going to say, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out demons? Didn't we do many deeds of power? And Jesus will say, I never knew you. Depart from me, you evildoers. So it's possible, it's possible to to think we're following the true path, to think we're in the light, and yet to have been deceived by darkness. And John calls those people the Antichrist. Now, when I say Antichrist, you probably immediately think of, oh, I don't know, scary horror movie of the devil and uh, you know a horned guy with, uh, with a pitchfork and a, and a tail and uh, cloven hooves. Or maybe you think of some 
evil person personified today, a Saddam Hussein and a Osama bin Laden, a uh, uh, Muammar Gaddafi, someone who's just so evil that we all agree you can see them coming from a thousand miles away. But the scripture tells us that the lies of Satan are so much more nuanced than that. They're so much more clever than that. The ink is ours, but the handwriting is his. So many times, the, the message of Satan comes to us in our own voice. M. Scott Peck, he's a psychotherapist who's passed away, but he wrote a book uh, called People of the Lie. You probably would recognize his book that was an international bestseller called The Road Less Travel, Traveled. But in People of the Lie, Peck described and discussed some extreme cases of dysfunctional behavior. And most of his patients he dealt with he said he could track them back to the source of their unhappiness, the source of their dysfunction, the cause of their problem was a lie. Yes, bad things had happened to them. Some had been mistreated. Some were abused as children. Uh, it had terrible, horrible things happen to them. But mostly they made bad decisions and were now paying for consequences of their own behavior that Peck said could be traced back to a certain uh, these are the kind of things that psychotherapists are trained to help us uncover. Uh, they, they get us to the root causes of our disorders, of our dysfunctions. And Peck's training had done nothing, though, to prepare him for these cases. All of his training, all of his textbooks, all of the things that he learned through his years of schooling had all ruled out this one word, evil. They all said there was no such thing as evil, that truth and goodness would be relative, and so it wouldn't apply to people. And listen to how uh, Dr. Peck describes these folks. They had lied to themselves. They had lied to others, not least to others, other members, members of their family. They had started believing and living by those lies. Somehow dark and incomprehensible as it may appear, they had invoked a kind of anti-power the power of the lie, an evil which was more than the sum total of their own deceits. And this power then went to work around them with devastating effects. Does that ring any scripture bells for you? It does for me. It reminds me of John chapter 8 when Jesus is addressing some folks and he says, if God were your father, you would love me for I've come from the father. I've not come on my own. God sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you're unable to hear what I say. And in verse 44, chapter 8, he says, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, listen to this, he speaks his native language. For he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Jesus is the devil, the antichrist, the, what we sometimes refer to as the man of lawlessness. They all have these same things in common. They all speak lies. What are some of those lies that we might have been tempted to believe? Well, see if any of these sound familiar. Your husband, your spouse, your significant other will only love you as long as you look like fill in the blank. The best thing that you can give to your kids, to your children, is a solid financial foundation. They need that more than they need your time or attention. Looking at images on a computer, that isn't cheating or sinful. It's a victimless crime. Nobody's hurt by that. Here's another popular lie. Stuff will make you happy. All of those lies have one thing in common. They all come from Satan. And John says, don't believe the lie. You walk, into the, walk in the light. Come into the light. Walk where the truth of God will illuminate your life. And so John gives a very simple answer. And this is all I want you to think about tonight. You probably heard the word remain. Remain. Go back and look. You can pause this recording and go back and, and track that word remain through the passage. And that word is a great word. Some of you have a different translation and you translate it how? Abide. It's kind of a Jesus-y church word. 
But John says, you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. I don't write to you because you don't know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie comes from the truth. And then drop down to verse 27. He says, as for you, the anointing you receive from him remains in you. You don't need anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as he had taught you, remain or abide in him. He says, if you're going to walk in the light, then stay connected to the one who tells you the truth. You know, that's good advice for anyone. For the folks in your life, make sure you stay close to the ones who will tell you the truth, the unvarnished truth, the truth that may offend you. Because I'd rather hear an offensive truth than a lie that will lead me uh, into sin. Arthur F. Burns, he was chairman of the United States Federal Reserve System. He was ambassador uh, at the time to West Germany. And he was a a man who was uh, had, had considerable gravitas. He was well respected in the community of the uh, in, in Washington D.C. Not an imposing figure, kind of medium height. He did have this wavy silver hair. He always carried his signature pipe with him. He was an economic counselor to numerous presidents, all the way from Dwight D. Eisenhower to Ronald Reagan. And when he spoke, his opinion carried weight. When he spoke, Washington listened. Arthur Burns also happened to be Jewish. And so when he began attending this informal White House prayer group in the 1970s, he was afforded this special respect. No one, in fact, not knew how to involve uh, Burns in this group because he was the only Jewish one amongst them. And so week after week, different people would take turns leading that meeting in prayer, and they would pass by respectfully. They would pass by Mr. Burns out of a really mixture of respect and not wanting to offend him. One week, however, there was a newcomer to the group. He didn't know about Burns' special situation, and so he Just as the meeting was coming to a close, the newcomer turned to Mr. Burns and said, would you close us with a prayer? Some of the old timers glanced around. Everyone got nervous. There was maybe a few coughs. They wondered what would happen next. But without missing a beat, Burns reached out, held hands with the others in the circle and prayed this prayer. He said, Lord, I pray that you would bring Jews to know Jesus Christ. I pray that you would bring Muslims to know Jesus Christ. And he said, finally, I pray that you would bring Christians to know Jesus Christ. What a beautiful and perfect prayer. That's what we want. If we're going to walk into the light, then we're going to have to know the one who is the light, to abide in him, remain in him, stay closely connected to him. That's what we do with the bugs of guilt and shame. That's how we fight back the lies of this world and of Satan. Remember, the ink is ours, the handwriting is the devil's. And don't for one minute believe or live into the lies of Satan. Instead, abide and remain in Jesus Christ. God bless you. Thanks for coming.